Johns Hopkins, Baltimore, Maryland. For three months in 1999, ABC News was given unprecedented access inside one of America's leading hospitals. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a team of journalists was allowed to witness intimate, candid moments, what really goes on inside a hospital. Now, some of those stories on Hopkins 24-7. First thing we'll do is we get a blood pressure. There's a possible chance that we put a chest tube in the chest. Uh, okay. Pressure comes up, get an X-ray. The bullet's just in the right chest that so we could okay. actually avoid laparotomy. So. Dr. Edward Cornwell is chief of trauma surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital. On many nights, Cornwell's efforts go into trying to save the wounded of East Baltimore's never-ending street wars. To the chest and the abdomen and the leg, multiple gunshots. I've seen, in large numbers, predominantly young minority males victimized by gunshot and stab wounds. Come on. Few surgeons choose to specialize in the rough and ready field of trauma. But for Cornwell, it is not just a career. It is a mission. It's right there. So it's behind, it's way back, so yeah. it went way posterior. You take care of trauma patients at large urban trauma centers, as I have. It brings home night after night, week after week, uh, in very real sense, the blessings that I've had. And I see a lot of people that I take care of that give me an opportunity to say, there, but for the grace of God, go I. This 18-year-old was brought to the ER with a bullet wound in his back. I'm Dr. Corner. Listen to me. Do you feel my? Do you feel my? Well, I'm, I need you to answer my question here. Do you feel my hand there? Make a fist. Make a fist. Hey, bake up. Make a fist. Weak on the medium. I am making a fist. Weak on the medium. 130 over 60. Talk to me. Uh, were, you, were you facing the bullet, or, from, or did it get you from behind? I was running. You were running away? So it went through his back and got his... 18-year-old kid from the neighborhood who shot. These kids, it's all about power. He came in here, went through his axillary. He's, he's got his axillary artery. He's got no pulse there. And he's got his brachial plexus, so he's weak and all. He's weak and all, ulnar, medium, and... When you come with a gunshot, when you've lost power. Put your legs down. Yeah, to get you don't know if you're going to live or die. People are taking off your clothes. Lots of hands all over you. And so a lot of these kids respond by seeing if they can intimidate whoever's around them. And uh, I, I ain't going for it. Can I you alive for, man. Can I cook? We, it's, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. We're operating on your savior on. So you, we're not your enemy. So don't, 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 need, don't need to get an attitude here. During the night, Dr. Cornwell would succeed in saving the man's arm. It is barely daybreak, but already Dr. Cornwell and the rest of the Johns Hopkins surgeons are gathering at the hospital. In a highly confidential meeting held every Tuesday morning, some of them are called on to review surgeries in which their patients either died or became gravely ill. What is said here is meant never to leave this room. This past week there were 195 total operations. There were four deaths and 20 complications. Mortality and morbidity conferences are held at hospitals across the country so that doctors can consider if mistakes were made and how they can do things better. Until now, Hopkins has never allowed the public to see one. Why don't we start um, with Dr. Chen's patient that uh, came in through the emergency room with trauma. Anything in retrospect do you think uh, we could have done any more rapidly or differently in this patient? I probably should have pushed harder to get him upstairs faster. Um, immediately after cross clamp, got him upstairs right away. And um, upon getting to the OR, when we opened, probably rather than trying to fix the liver injury with a few stitches, just sort of packed everything quickly 
and try to take off the, get them off cross clamp quicker and then just to the ICU without any attempted repair until we could get them stabilized. Dr. Cornwell here. Yes. Um, Eddie, uh, it's hard to imagine things going much more quickly in terms of getting them to the OR. Right. I mean, th these Any were, suggestions? Uh, well, these sound like lethal injuries, but the, the points her make perhaps will benefit the next patient. At that point, a young patient had to have lost half of his blood volume or more. So there's no role for definitive repair. You're going to pack what you can, stop gross contamination, and try and continue resuscitation in the ICU and come back at a later day. But um, Herb actually spoke to me on the phone as he was at that point where he had the clamp on, was in the OR, and there's a characteristic smell that you have when someone has already had hypovolemic arrest plus the aortic cross clamp, and it's, you'll never forget it once you smell it, and the smell of death, really. Having the public have free access to come and go and observe mortality and morbidities would not be in their best interest. It is in our best interest to have them uh, take place in an atmosphere in which we can be honest and open. So, Dr. Campbell, this patient died of acute respiratory distress syndrome without any known cause. Is that right? Do you have an explanation for the course? I don't really. Um, somewhat emotionally and intellectually unsatisfying, obviously. Um, in the operating room, um, things, as I said, were entirely uneventful, and initially she well, did well. Why, why was she acidotic? I don't, I don't have a... I mean, did she have a low cardiac output? In the operating room? Yeah. She didn't have a PA catheter, so I can't um, her vital signs speak were normal? to that, but her vital signs were normal. No excessive bleeding. Any so that. was that noted in the operating room that she was acidotic? It was noted in the operating room and was treated by the anesthesia team, yes, sir. Surgeons are very competitive individuals. And when there are disagreements about what should have been done and somebody thinks he or she did the right thing, a complication developed, and another surgeon says, look, you did the wrong thing, this is the way you should have done it. That's a setting in which there can be some heated debates. Um, just to allay uh, everyone's fears that I would operate on a patient electively with a severe metabolic acidosis, um, my patient's preoperative anion gap was nine. Um, no disrespect to Dr. Dardick, but maybe he, in the heat of battle here, the sodium was 136, the chloride 106, and the bicarb was 21, with B and cranium is 17 and 1.1, with a normal anion gap. You don't want somebody meek, unsure of himself or herself, worried about making a mistake when they're operating on you. You want somebody who is confident that they can do the job. A good surgeon is someone who doesn't lose his cool in the operating room and is always in control and um, really needs to be the captain of the ship and the leader of the team. Paul Columbani has been a pediatric surgeon for 19 years. People that go into pediatric surgery are surgeons who have the disposition and temperament to deal with families, deal with distraught parents, deal with very difficult problems, sometimes unfixable problems in children. Sometimes I think I'm like the angel of death because I have so many sick, sick patients and many of them don't make it. But, um, but again, I take patients that everyone else has turned down or afraid to do. It's a more demanding, especially, than many others. And it's more rewarding, too, I think. I think children in general do better. Many of them, you affect a cure for them, a surgical cure for them in their first day of life, and you fix them for the rest of their lives. Hello. Hi. I'm Dr. Colin Bonney. What brings you all in to see us today? They sent us here <clears throat> to find out like what everything is and what like what treatment and stuff I'm gonna have to get. Tiffany uh, has a, a tumor. We think the tumor is a sarcoma based on a biopsy of the uterus. That is a very bad problem to have. So what's the bleeding been like? Every day, a lot of blood. Tiffany Salvadea is only 14 years old, but depending on what type of cancerous tumor she has she may need a hysterectomy that will leave her unable to bear children. If it's a, a sarcoma that is totally confined to the uterus and we remove it surgically, that's a cure. But since this is arising in the lower part of the uterus, we probably need to remove the whole uterus to make sure it gets, we get the tumor out. Okay. The other alternative is that it's amenable to chemotherapy um, and they'll shrink down to nothing and we can maybe even just do a partial resection of the uterus and save it. 
So it's really, we're kind of in limbo, you know, kind of waiting around. I know this is a lot to think about, kind of right off the bat. We need to get them through this whole thing. And this may be a six or 12 months or 18 month ordeal. And there's not anything that I can do. And that's the hardest part, is not knowing, you know. I'm scared, but like, I just don't know what to be scared about right now because we don't really know anything. It is late at night when a new arrival is rushed discreetly through one of the hospital's side doors, suffering from a mysterious stomach disorder. You got it, Andy? We got him. Peter is a 20-year-old sea turtle who lives at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Got it, Chris? Yeah. All right. I have it steady. Okay. His keepers have brought the 180-pound reptile here because of Hopkins' reputation for diagnosing even the most baffling ailments. Did you stop eating? Is that the yeah, the report is he hasn't been eating for about seven to ten days. How far up should his head be? Is this a snail? Actually, if it grabs your finger, it'll take it off. Okay, let's just get him over and let him chill out for a minute. Well, you know what? You know, this is nothing. They're trying to have me do the octopus. Right. Yes. The octopus will keep moving. We've done sea otters, dolphin. We, we did, you know, Inca mummy. We did the Inca mummy, right? There's National Geographic. We did uh, Egyptian mummies. Peter is the turtle's name, uh, like pain in the ankle. The Peter's a very uh, uh, enthusiastic and uh, investigative turtle, and the divers so named it because this turtle had come uh, when the divers went in to feed the animals and would basically uh, uh, grab them by the ankle or any other part just to get, get some of the food, which is how we knew that Peter wasn't doing well because uh, he stopped this behavior, sat in the bottom of the pool for a while and has not been eating, and we know that's quite abnormal for Peter. Yeah, watch the flipper. Do watch the flipper. He's got a nail in it. Uh, Peter is a welcome distraction for doctors, used to facing human patients and the emotional stress that accompanies serious illness. Dr. Paul Columbani has been hoping Tiffany Salvadea's cancer can be treated by chemotherapy instead of a hysterectomy. But a few days after Tiffany's visit, test results appear inconclusive. Hello. Hi, Mrs. Thomas. Yes. Yeah, this is Dr. Columbani down in Baltimore. Hi, how are, how you? are you? The family lives in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where John Salvadea is a police officer. I talked to Dr. Hellman of the markers that they had pending. They were all negative for rhabdomyosarcoma. And okay, so we know it's sarcoma, but we don't know what it is. Right, and each one has a little bit different twist on what the best therapy is. So is this a good thing that it's not random or, or, or? Well, it's still, it's kind of in between. As we talked about, um, uh, sarcoma is not a great kind of cancer to have, but there are some kinds that do better than others, and, right. and, and the treatment's different. So that's why we wanna, we wanna make sure. Okay, so we're still playing the waiting game. Yes. The benefit to Tiffany would be to give her the specific therapy that would be the best chance to cure. It also gives her the best chance to see if we can salvage in her uterus. Yeah, she's not thinking much about that now. Oh, Ten I years know. from now, she's clear. Yeah, but when she's 25 or yeah. 30, she will be. Danine, you have any more questions? Mm -mm. Okay. We'll wait right. to hear from your office. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night now. Good night. Good night. Bye. Okay. Can I know now? Nothing. You don't know anything. Apparently this is a, a tough one to do all the surgery and stuff when then they'll get a test bag and say, geez, we didn't need to do all that surgery. We could have fixed it just with this chemo juice here. I was hoping to have an answer. Yeah, we're waiting. Just the way it is. Yeah. Where's the gunshot wound, do you know? By the time they get to me, so many things have gone wrong for them to be in front of the barrel of the gun that there's no true prevention at this end. It's too late. We got to get out before before they come to us. Dr. Eddie Cornwell 
has invited this group of East Baltimore youngsters to visit the hospital, hoping that what they see may prevent them from winding up like his patients. The kids that are in school right now, grades K through 12, have more hours of violence on television that they view than any other generation in history, less likely to come from a home with a nonviolent male role model than any generation in history, and uh, easier access to guns than any generation in history. The message is not do A, B, C, and D, and you too will be a doctor. How's everyone doing? How y'all doing? Y'all ready for what we got? What we got to show you. Yeah. Just a small crowd today, huh? How you doing? All right, we're gonna go. The message is. These are the choices that you make. These are the consequences of negative choices. He had a gunshot wound to the abdomen. And uh, the reason I want you all to see him is because he can, show, he can demonstrate both by what you see and what he tells you, probably some, some points that are more important than what I could tell you. So the goal overall is to remove the glamour from the culture of violence. He was hanging out, arguing with someone over drug turf, going to get a gun, and he got shot twice. He had two bullets that went from here to there, through his chest, hitting his lungs, and the muscle between his chest and his abdomen, and virtually every organ, every structure in the top of his abdomen, two separate bullets coming through. And at the end of that operation, 13 hours, he couldn't even close his abdomen. This is all pink stuff, this is healed in. To me, this looks good, oh, it's granulating in. Can you imagine, that's, that's, that's what happens in surgery. You start to call things like this a success. But that means you, you're ignoring all the things that's happening with the patient. Doesn't eat the normal way, doesn't go to the bathroom the normal way, has been in bed. You see how much muscle he's lost compared to that pump guy in that picture four to six months ago. What, what happened? Being on somebody too. That's where that came from. Supposed to have been a friend. He shot me up, trying to leave me for dead. So y'all think about what y'all seen today. Them guns ain't no joke. I don't want to be in here. I be in pain. I can't breathe sometimes. And I was in the physical fitness before this happened. They chalked me up for dead. Them guns ain't no joke. Stay away from them. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I got to. I got to. Thanks. Stay strong, man. All right. Okay. So what do y'all think? Is this what you expected? No. What'd you expect? Something a little bit more cleaned up, not that messed up. That looks messed up, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, can you imagine yourself not being able to eat that long? No. Or having to go to the bathroom out of a bag? That's what happens. That's what happens after, after those types of injuries. Maybe this will help you. What do you think? And I should just stick to basketball, stay out of trouble. That's real. I never do no drugs ever in my life. End up like that. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm trying to get me a college education. Try to go to the pros. Don't hang around those type of people because even though if you're not in the gang and you with somebody that's in the gang, you still can end up like that. Mm -hmm. It's easy to, to, to go wrong. It's around us. It's all around us. <coughs> you wouldn't have to work very hard if you wanted to. And that's why it's important to me to talk to you before you get, have, have that opportunity. Because everybody can do wrong. I don't care where you live, what part of town, everyone has the opportunity. It's, it's around all of us. The good surgeon is not someone only who can cut and sew well, good technical skills, but also has good judgment. We're not there to criticize. We're there to learn so that the next time anybody in the room has that choice, they're going to have this experience upon which to make their judgment and perhaps avoid a complication. So she died in the operating room? Yeah, she was declared dead about uh, an hour and a half after we started. Mm -hmm. If we'd have operated on her during that admission, this perhaps all would have been avoided Correct. and she could have survived. 
Did she still have her folio? Did she have her folio? Uh, no, she did not. There must have been change in her vital signs, elevation of her diastolic uh, pressure, narrowing of her pulse pressure. There had to have been some clue with that magnitude of uh, a drop in her hemoglobin. Um, uh, you couldn't anticipate this, but if she'd had a Foley in, certainly it would have been picked up quicker. Was there an elevation of her diastolic pressure? I, I can't noticed. comment on the on the vitals. Uh, by the time I got involved, the patient was in, and I haven't uh, reviewed the vitals from late morning. Every patient wants to think his or her doctor is not going to make a mistake, that doctors are smart, they're well trained, they went to a good medical school, they're not going to make mistakes. But it's like any other profession, mistakes are inevitable. You know, when you and I and most of the attendings in this room were in training, this patient probably never would have been discharged after the, the canceled operation. The patient would have been kept in the hospital, observed, wait till the kidney function gets better. And I think we're seeing the impact of fast track to early discharge on the outcomes of, of the healthcare we're trying to deliver. I think that's a good point. But again, this patient was in the hospital when she no, ruptured her aneurysm. No, and we weren't smart enough to pick it up. And Obviously, the object of this exercise is to try and figure out how we'll be smart enough next time, but I don't see any obvious signs that we missed that we should be able to pick up next time. With Tiffany Salvadea now in pain from the tumor growing in her uterus, her parents bring her back to Hopkins. A decision must be made on whether or not she will need a hysterectomy. Dr. Columbani orders a CT scan, but first the hospital needs to be sure that her HMO approves the procedure. Okay, but as an outpatient area, we need authorization, authorization for the HMO. It's all the other tests I got done here says reference not required. I think you need to eat. I don't know, but it hurts. Is it like an eight? Is it like a throb? It's like someone stabbing me from the inside. I have to have a referral number. It's an ongoing referral number, I guess. Is so there one number you can use for the rest of the time, or every time we so. stop somewhere, we're going to do this again? I have to do the diagnosis codes and the procedure codes, and we have to submit them to the insurance company ahead of time, and they have to say yay or nay, we're not going to do this, you have to do that. I think it is um, ridiculous that a high school clerk should be telling me that I can or cannot do an operation on a patient. I'm going to uh, my economics two class for, to finish, I need three courses to get my MBA. In the brave new world of managed care, veteran doctors are going back to school, learning how to balance the new financial pressures with the needs of their patients. The main reason is to, uh, is, uh, to be able to make sure that no administrators are gonna pull any wool over my eyes. The business climate of medicine has corrupted medicine in many respects. And it, it, it cuts through the whole system. The managed care organizations decide, well, if we get all the fluff out of the hospitals and, and make them bid against each other to go the lowest possible way, we can pocket the difference between what it costs to do the care and what we're charging. Okay, the CAT scan is going to have to be authorized, so your primary care is going to have to definitely call that in. Because if not... My uh, primary care. I'm going to do now. Wait so they figure out what's going on. Uh, this insurance got to go. Who do they have to call? Well, I don't know. My HMO person, and she's off today. <laughs> this is crazy. And all it is, it's for a insurance company to get an extra $20 saved by that scan being done where they want it done. It hurts. So they can pocket the 15 or 20 dollars. It's not to provide extra scans for everybody. <laughs> um, it's to it's to line their own pockets. I can deal with my daughter's cancer, but I can't deal with HMO and what referral I have and who do I call. My daughter has cancer. I want to concentrate on her and getting her better and not have to worry about if I have a referral for this or a referral for that. This night, paramedics report that they are bringing in a gunshot wound. It's a delta trauma. 
the most serious kind of injury. Okay, we'll see you in critical care. Thank you. Dr. Edward Cornwell responds to the call. Let's go to room three. Three's got somebody in it. How long is that guy going to be staying? I don't know. Can we order him a room at the hotel? Because we got a gunshot, so it'd be easier to work it I in know. here. I didn't realize this guy was still in here. Okay, here he comes. Okay. We need to get another stretcher in here. Yeah, it's on the hallway. How bad is this guy? Hopefully not too bad. We're not really set up for him. When you're going down there, you don't know if you're going to have someone who's going to be declared dead in a minute or someone who has ultimately turned out to have minimal or no injuries or someone who you need to turn around and rush to the operating room in five minutes. And so you're preparing yourself for the battle ahead. By the time Cornwell arrives, it is too late. No amount of surgical skill will change the outcome. Well, we have a gunshot wound to the head, no signs of life, no pulse, no pressure. As we said, came in dead and stayed dead. No, didn't respond to any resuscitative efforts. And uh, uh, who knows? He's young, so you know, no one knows his name, who he is. He's, he's male Z. That's what he is right now. Male Z. Young black male, shot in the head. Yet another patient brought in dead. There's lots of feelings, if I explore them, that, that, that go on. There's the feeling of frustration, that you can't save this one. There's the feeling of, of a little bit of helplessness. One thing that helps me maintain my sanity is I've been able to achieve some sort of separation in the sense that work is work and home is home. And I don't let the two mix. My passion, uh, apart from medicine, is my family. It's everything. <laughs> Some days his emotions come full circle. After 36 hours on call, Eddie Cornwell comes home to celebrate his birthday. That's Daddy's birthday cake. That's mine. <laughs> You can have some if you want. In this profession, the profession of trauma and critical care, it brings before you all the time uh, with very sick and injured patients, in a very real sense, a recognition of, of, of how blessed you are. <laughs> to get to the root of his eating disorder, Peter the turtle is given a sonogram. It's 53 centimeters from the tip of his nose, the tip of his beak. But radiologists have trouble locating the turtle's stomach. And when they do, the sound waves aren't strong enough to penetrate his thick skin. If we stay medial and angle lateral, we can't get that kind of depth. PETA had also been given an MRI, another way to try to see inside his body. We've done a lot of other animals, so it's kind of, we've done sea otters and sea lions, and so one of the things you try to do is use all the knowledge you have about patients, and things almost look in some ways the same. In some sense, you're guessing a lot. In some sense, some things are obvious. I don't know what those things are, but these, 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 like, this is the stomach, right? I believe that's the stomach. There is variation between, obviously, us and a turtle, but it's amazing how similar everything is. It's also interesting because even the veterinarian, you know, with the animal, their knowledge of these animals is not extensive either since it's very limited experience of autopsies or anything else. In some ways, it's a lot of fun trying to figure out, uh, you know, what exactly is going on. Here, here it looks like he has miliary nodules. Maybe he has TB. I mean, he has nodules in his lung. Yes. He has infection in his lung. It's a very common problem in sea turtles, for infection in the lung. What's this? But then, PETA's doctor sees something highly unusual. What's this thing? That thing that uh, is very dense, yeah. I think it just passed. No, right, right now, I have my finger Maybe right. this is, is it? Is that a mass there? What is Same as this over here. No, it's not. No, no it's not. It's different. It looks like an That's a mass or a tumor. This it's turtle a, just has two. Can see what's going on? Can you pick up uh, at all what you thought this was here? That's not a normal thing. I mean, look, it looks like a little telephone here. Here? That's like a foreign body or something. Well, we're going to do a 3D on this, but we got to send it across the street. Yeah. I'll take care of that.
Dr. Paul Columbani knows he can't wait right. any longer to remove the tumor from Tiffany Salvadea's uterus. You've been having a lot of pain? Yeah. In your side? Yeah. We got a call yesterday from the doctors in, at the NIH and they said that all the studies were the same as they had been then. And their opinion would be that we go ahead and get the surgery done. Okay. And um, to cure you of this problem, then we need to we need to take the uterus out. But we would preserve your ovaries and leave them so they would still be functional. Okay. So, okay. And I could deal with all this, but I'm having an HMO problem, and they're not going to do a CT scan. A so CT can... scan is the only way to pinpoint the location of the tumor. They said okay. don't come back without a referral number. That makes us crazy, too. I can override some of this stuff. We'll just do it for free. We have a policy that we're not going to turn anybody away that has cancer that um, just because their HMOs screw up. It's frustrating. Dr. Columbani goes ahead with the CT scan, even though the hospital may end up paying for it. The HMO knows that if they authorize 100 CT scans, it costs them X dollars, and if they can defer a CT scan to the next month, you know, it's on next month's bottom line. How are her symptoms coming in? Uh, she had started having some um, vaginal bleeding in August and was kind of poo pooed for, uh, for a month or six weeks, and then finally, in end of October, she got a study which showed that she had a mass in the uterus. The reason I wanted to do this study is that it's been a month since her last CT scan, and so I'm concerned whether this is broken out of the uterus or not. To answer that question, yes, it has. Great. Um, huge, huge mass. Yeah. A lot of uh, retained material within the uterus, a lot of it necrotic. Yeah. Uh, on the pelvic sidewall on the left, you have this mass. Great. So it's, it's inside. It's, it's huge. And the incidental below that or something. Oh, sure. The deal is, is that you want to get these tumors early as you can so they can be resectable. And you want them small enough that you can resect them with margins and cure the patient. Once it's broken out of the tissue, it's not curable. Her energy was gone, you know. John Salvadea thinks other doctors could have detected Tiffany's cancer earlier if the HMO had been quicker to approve tests. Why didn't they give her a blood test when, when she came in to visit the pediatrician? Was it because she's on that, that her, you know, her HMO thing? Or they didn't want to run the cost up? They're, you know, they're told not to uh, do unnecessary testing. Is that why they didn't give her the test? Is that why they didn't catch it? We see um, delays in diagnosis because of the um, inadequacies of the managed care system all the time. And for the 0.1% you know, of the patients, where it turns out to be a life or death situation. They, they just look at that as the price of doing business. It's pathetic. In October or September or whatever, uh, though that was the time to do that surgery. Now we're playing catch up. And hopefully, if we're real aggressive, we'll catch up. For Dr. Eddie Cornwell, another night, another 18-year-old victim of Baltimore's senseless street violence. This young man is in danger of bleeding to death from bullet wounds in his chest and abdomen. Come on, come on, come on. Where's my line? Where's my line? Where's my line? Keeping the patient supplied with fresh blood to replace what he has lost is a constant worry. We take care of patients as best we can, frequently not knowing their name. When our patients come in, we start going into the resuscitation, the diagnosis, and the treatment, and all of that may take 10 minutes before you're in the operating room in that patient's abdomen and still may not know their name. 
Now, for all the excitement that trauma surgery represents in terms of taking care of the anatomic injury, and it is exciting. I'm about ready to get really messy down here. Oh my gosh. I don't think we can keep up with the volume. I don't think we're right. If we did that alone, trauma surgeons would be just reduced to medics patching up the next patient in an unwinnable war, time after time after time. And it gets very depressing if you just did that and that alone. So every week, Dr. Cornwell spends time with East Baltimore youngsters at a local recreation center. How's it going? Man? You want to play? Yes. You ready? Yes. All right, we'll play. Okay. He calls the visits who, Rap who, with who, Doc. Who do, you all, who do you all see as your, your heroes? Just give me one or two names. Might be Joe. Anybody got any heroes that are not athletes? At the end of the day, you have an opportunity to interact with kids that may not have a positive male role model. Can you say no to that? All those guys, every, everyone that you named, they couldn't play. I couldn't play it, then they had the grades. It's obvious to me now that prevention, getting out, talking with these kids, being with them, is part of the job. And doing it well means perhaps we can prevent one of them from becoming the next gunshot wound. If I had a magic wand to wave, it would be two parents in every house. I smile when I go home every night because there's a little boy who has a family, an extended family that love him, uh, and a happy little boy with a bright future. Did you have a good Thanksgiving yesterday, or was it all sort of scary because of this? I was kind of in pain. So. Uh, OK. Well, we're going to fix that, all okay. right? The one thing that we're going to be really good at, all right, <laughs> is taking care of that part of your problem, all right? All right. I want you to just close your eyes for a moment, all right? Enjoy your nap. OK, Mom, I'll give her a kiss. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mom. We'll take good care of her, yeah. all right? We're going to take good care of her. OK. And I'll be there when she wakes up. Or we won't let anything happen to her. OK. Let me walk you out. If Dr. Columbani succeeds in saving Tiffany's ovaries, she could still have children by using in vitro fertilization and a surrogate to bear her child. And um, we'll leave her ovaries, mm -hmm. probably transplant them to the midline. But everything depends on how far the cancer has spread. Yeah. Okay, Mara, we're going to get started. Need some lab tape, uh, incision. Please. feel that the main mass is separate from this. Yeah. So I think we're going to be doing two resections, basically. So I think this is a lymph node mass mm -hmm. that we're going to have to go after separately. At last, Dr. Columbani has a clear view of Tiffany's tumor. He discovers that the cancer is now in her lymph nodes and one of her ovaries. Like right have the other one back. Okay, we've got the tumor out, which is really the uterus and the tumor within it. The upper uterus. Um, actually, the uh, left ovary and uh, right fallopian tube. It looked pretty clear to me, so I just wanted to confirm that. It looks clear all the way around. Okay. To be sure he's gotten all of the tumor, Dr. Columbani also cuts out a margin of the healthy cancer-free tissue that surrounds it. Hello. Hi, room 14. Um, they want to check margins on a uterine tumor. Hi. Hi. It's uh, grossly the, the vaginal wall looked pretty free. Yeah. What okay. we did is the two areas that look closest to the margin, we froze two perpendicular mm -hmm. margins. So here's your tumor yeah. right here. These two pieces of tissue aren't connected, so you're at least a centimeter here. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Columbani has been able to save one of Tiffany's ovaries. But now he must tell her parents that cancer cells may still remain in her lymph system. Um, what we found is kind of like what the CT scan showed, that there was a, the big tumor in the, in the uterus. And because of that left side was all kind of a swollen involved, the blood vessels to that ovary were also involved. So we took that left ovary out. We left her own right, right. ovary. 
we left that in. That should function normally. Okay. Okay? Because I think there's some lymph gland involvement over here, she's probably going to need some other treatment. It might be some radiation. Um, but um, this is not totally removed. Yeah, but we we got everything out that we need that we could, okay? She's not going to be any more pain. Um, this should she'll feel better now. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. 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 I'm glad we got it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that's the important thing. So um, if she gets another lump, we go after and take it out. Okay. So. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Can I give you a hug? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. I know it's hard on all of you. <laughs> then three days after surgery, Tiffany's fortunes take a dramatic turn for the better. So maybe just a couple of days in the hospital and be able to get you out of here. Okay. Okay. Lab tests show she has a type of cancer that is highly responsive to chemotherapy. Probably never really free of the, the risk. But for practical purposes, the chance of recurrence after five years is probably less than 1% chance. Should be good. I'm going back to school and seeing all my friends. That's what I'm looking forward to. But. Yeah, well, I got this 3D thing working with. That is so amazing. See, there it is. 3D imaging finally exposes the likely cause of PETA's lackluster appetite. This is perfectly round. This is so perfectly round. Yeah. Well, the thing is, this looks like, keep going, this looks like a ball. This is a ball, okay? That's a ball. Mm. Yeah, but see, it's oh, not perfectly round, though, like, because look, there's, there's something there's connected to it. See, right here. Mm. There's a stomach. A ball would be yeah. fat. Well, once it could be something in the stomach. I mean, it's something, it's just How, so what rare. What is the size of that? Could it be a soup ball? Yeah, it could be a soup ball. Soup balls are low yeah. density. Yeah, are about that big, though. Soup balls, are, soup balls, yeah, it's three, the super ball is this. Yeah. Would that be the right density? Okay. It's, it's a possibility. If you're not eating, right, the most likely thing would be something in the stomach. Try to get that, get that first. That's where yeah. our first. Fantastic. Thank you very Thank much. This is incredible information. The foreign object, what we think is a foreign object, we're going to go down and take a look in the stomach and see if we can't pull it out and do that as soon as possible. Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> it's been a big, big help. You guys did all the work. I think we learned a lot. Just to get a bunch of cool images probably wouldn't be that important. The fact that maybe we helped, maybe this will result in a good, a good outcome for the turtle. You know, uh, that'd, be, that'd be fun. So hopefully things will work out and they'll live happily ever after.